Both Alex Soth and Andre Codrescu share a curiosity in the narratives found along the banks of the Mississippi River in the art of storytelling and portrait making in general. Soth is a photographer living in Minneapolis whose pictures have made it big. Last year, one could find them on the walls of both the Whitney and Sao Paulo Biennials and at solo shows in England, Germany, San Francisco, and New York. He's, he is the recipient of the highly sought after awards that one can receive around here, namely fellowships from the McKnight and Jerome Foundations, in addition to a recent solo show ever, over at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. He received the Santa Fe Prize for Photography in 2003, and he was nominated to Magnum Photo the next year. Andre Codrescu is a Louisiana-based poet, novelist, essayist, screenwriter, and columnist on National Public Radio. He is the author of nearly 40, 30 books, maybe 40 by now, um, and seems to be able to write on just about anything, history, politics, love, Burger King, golf, Elvis, grammar, sleeping, and the devil, perhaps one of his favorite subjects. He also edits a literary journal called Exquisite Corpse and holds the position of McCurdy Distinguished Professor of English at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. From their respective posts at either end of America's Great River Road, Kodrescu and Soth are both engaged in the complex art of pulling words and images out of the everyday world that blazes around them. Although Soth has been known to say that photography doesn't suit up well to the task of telling a story, one might argue that the pages of his first book, Sleeping by the Mississippi, transport the viewer to a different place in much the same way that a novel or a poem does. Can a photograph tell a story? Can a poem? Let's leave these questions up to the poet and the photographer. Please welcome Andre Kodrescu, who will further introduce Alex Soth. Thank you, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. It probably is 40, but I mean, you know, some of them are very tiny and they're exactly like the ones that came before. <laughs> it's always great to be in Minneapolis, uh, sometimes in retrospect, but uh, um, the occasion is always great, and the, this occasion certainly is. Uh, I uh, love Alex's photographs of the Mississippi. Um, uh, as Sarah said, I live on the other end of the Mississippi, the one that the entire continent puts their garbage in <laughs> until it gets to us. You live on the upper part, so uh, 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 coming here is always an effort of some kind because I go against the gravity. It's the natural flow of the river, which is what brought me there in the first place, and I couldn't go and live somewhere else. But uh, actually, uh, the river flows against the gravitational flow of the uh, planet. And I'm telling you this without the physics involved, because that would take too long. Um, but I live on the other side, and I'm involved in an endless documentary um, uh, about the Mississippi River, which follows two directions. One, beginning in uh, the source of the river in Minnesota, and going to the delta, something, uh, a direction uh, I call downflow ethics. It follows the decay of uh, civic and political probity and, and life from uh, Minneapolis to uh, New Orleans. This uh, idea brought on actually by a case, a local case at some point when uh, one of your councilmen was busted for distributing Twinkies at an old folks home and that was considered bribery somehow in Minneapolis and he had to do two weeks of community service. This is at the time that our Governor Edwards was giving suitcases full of cash to uh, guys from Las Vegas he owed money to. And uh, he's in jail now, by the way. So. Uh, when they asked our populace, the newspaper asked the population there what they thought about our governor giving uh, suitcases full of cash to guys from Vegas, he owed money to, everybody said, well, if it is money. <laughs> so we have different outlooks in that way. On the other hand, uh, there is another direction in which the river uh, exports its culture, and from the delta up comes the music, and it goes up the river. Uh, toward you. So I've tried to follow these two directions and try to make a documentary and eventually it will be made and it will be about 75 hours long. 
and it will show at all the centroplexes in America. And people will sleep at my movie instead of sleeping in front of their TVs like they do now. Um, I mean, if you have to sleep somewhere, you know. So when I saw Alex's uh, photographs, I immediately, immediately struck a chord with me because he photographs a kind of r river and people along the, that river that uh, are in a way forgotten and yet they are very much present and they are a great part of the river. A river that is now in transition. There was a time when the river was very important to this continent. In fact, it defined the continent after the Louisiana Purchase. And then there was a time when uh, we forgot about the river and everybody turned their back, all the cities turned their back to the river and except New Orleans, which has no choice because it's waiting for a river to drown it. But um, there was that long, long time. And then during that time, all the flotsam that went down the river, the people, the, the garbage, the driftwood, uh, the, the restless souls, the people who couldn't find peace anywhere, they uh, navigated the river, they, they stopped along the river, some of them stayed along the river. That's a real place and uh, it still exists and it's, uh, it's, it has its own amazing uh, you know, stories and mythology and all of that, which I found in, in, in Alex Oates' pictures. Um, now we live in a time when all, all the cities are turning back to the river. They're rediscovering the river. The tourism bureaus are rediscovering downtowns and they're rediscovering the river. So the slowly our cities are turning back to the river because they realize it's a, it's a great resource and they're looking at it as a way to revive the cities. But it's more than that. I mean, there are ineffables involved, there are stories involved, and there are um, all sorts of things that the river knows and that the city and the river know uh, from each other during the time when they were supposedly uh, uh, not uh, connected, uh, when the, the backs of the cities and the front of the river and so on. And now as this, this, this change happens, it's an amazing time of its attention that releases the stories of the river. And that's where um, I, see, I see those stories uh, actually in, in Alex's photos. Um, I guess we'll probably talk more about this, but uh, um, um, thank you. And here is the man who photographs that river, Alex O. Thanks so much. Um, when, when Sarah invited me to, to participate in this event, she asked me who I wanted to join me on stage. and. Uh, Andre was sort of a perfect choice, he, um, the other side of the river, a poet, uh, I, I think a lover of travel, and, but that wasn't my real reason. The real reason was to distract everyone from paying attention to me, and, uh, <laughs> but I didn't realize that I was going to be giving a talk following Andre, which is a little frustrating, but uh, <laughs> I'm just going gonna, gonna to dive right in just to give you a little bit Hopefully it's going to work. Background on me. Uh, so, I'm, I wanted to be a painter. This was, here I am in high school with an, with an old painting behind me. This is a painting of a bed in water, which I did uh, in college. just want you to remember this for, for a moment. Don't worry, we're not going to do every slide of, of every image I've ever made. Um, in college, I realized I was a bad painter and tried out other things, did earthworks, that sort of thing. That was a bit of a failure. Um, and then I went to a lecture by the photographer Joel Sternfeld. And, and Joel had done this project called American Prospects, where he had driven around America photographing the social landscape. And he, he showed this slide, and he said, look right there, that's the car that I drove around in. And I had this big kind of eureka moment that this could be my life, uh, you know, I could, I could drive around the country taking pictures. And, and it took me a long time to get there, but eventually I, but eventually I did. Um, and this is not my picture. <laughs> I didn't, this is uh, Robert Frank's uh, last image in The Americans. And I, I, I see sort of an emerging theme here about stories, so I, I just, I want to talk about that and clarify that for a second. Um, I, I do have this idea that photography is is not good at telling stories, um, and it's 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 partly my interest in having a poet here this evening is that 
and, and a novelist, is that I sort of see filmmaking and novels as being, as being narrative engines where they have, uh, they have a beginning, middle, and end, but they also have something that forces you to flip the page that makes you want to ha see what happens next. And photography for me functions very differently and it's, and it's extremely frustrating that it can't do that. So in analyzing the situation, I said, well, what is it about photography that works for me? And, and in the end, it's something like poetry, I think, where there's a big world out there. And when you look at a photograph, for me, I'm, looking, I'm thinking about the photographer or I'm thinking about the poet responding to the world out there. This picture from Frank's The Americans uh, is of his, his wife and child in the car. And, and it makes you sort of go back to all the previous pictures and think about this was a real photographer driving around the country. And, and for me, that's really exciting and, and something we can perhaps talk about later. Uh, when I was in college, I did briefly uh, do a project traveling along the Mississippi River during one spring break, made these pictures. Uh, it's been a recurring theme. But it wasn't until many years later uh, that my photography kind of came together with this project. It's called From Here to There. And the idea is that one picture leads to the next. So photograph a boy with a chicken, boy with an egg. <laughs> You'll notice the Superman tattoo on his arm, Superman suit, on and on it went like that. And it wasn't, wasn't quite working for me. It, there wasn't enough information in the picture, so I, I started all over again, this time in color. So here we have the world's smallest church somewhere in Iowa, uh, another world's smallest church in Iceland. And on and on it went. And, and after a while I thought it was kind of gimmicky and when people looked at the pictures they were just looking for those connections. Um, so it, it, along the way I would made this picture of Charles Lindbergh's boyhood bed. And I thought it was a really poignant picture and that his bed is overlooking the Mississippi, it's outside, the idea of this, this young boy with this incredible life ahead of him, sleeping by the river, and a uh, very romantic idea. So I, so I said, well, why not make the, the obvious subject, the river itself, but still play those games of from here to there or still have that, that sense of wandering but on the surface have it be about the river. And, so, and that led to sleeping by the Mississippi. And so a picture like this, a uh, guy holding planes is, is much like, you know, refers back to Charles Lindbergh's boyhood bed. His name incidentally is Charles and, uh, and just two weeks ago, a British publication reproduced this and actually the caption said Charles Lindbergh, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> um, Andre talked about how the, the river did function in America in, in a totally different way at one point. And, and when it stopped func functioning that way, so many people left. And, and there's something interesting to me about the people who remain, um, who, who fashion maybe a creative life for themselves in, this, in, in these smaller areas or forgotten areas. This, this guy, Peter, uh, in Winona, Minnesota, is, has lived in this houseboat for 25 years. Lenny, uh, Minneapolis. Thing I want you to note here is the pad of paper on the table. It was accidentally left there, but when I photograph people, I would often ask them to write down on a sheet of paper what their dream is. And here's some examples, you know. Never ended up using these, but it was it was kind of an important backbone for the working process. This is in, uh, this is in Kentucky, and the, the, a work, you know, prison work crew. The guy second from the left is a, uh, he, had, he had my favorite dream in the whole book. His dream was to own and operate his own pilot school, which I thought was really, it was both specific and, and grand in a way. Beds in the water, I told you it would come back. Whoops, hello. This is an abandoned house. And for me, a lot of the joy of this is the, 
is the just going into an abandoned house. For me, uh, talking about earthworks type, type artwork where you're making a pile of stones and photographing it, say, I, I sometimes have this feeling that the, the art is the, is the experience of moving through the world and that the photograph is just some sort of documentation of this. One of the very few pictures of, with water in it, there, it's, it's less about the Mississippi than the idea of the Mississippi. It's mother and daughter. Uh, the daughter's dream was to be a registered nurse, I remember. This is at an Angola State Prison in Louisiana, which is the largest maximum security prison in the country. Johnny Cash's boyhood home. Bonnie, who's a, a Pentecostal preacher's wife with a, a picture of a cloud that looks like an angel. So, you know, I, uh, I ask people if I can go into their house a lot of times and, and I photograph them and sometimes their house becomes more interesting. This was uh, Jimmy's apartment in, in Memphis. It, uh, I, I'd always travel in the springtime, so it was kind of cold in the north and, and blossoming as I got in the south. This is in Baton Rouge, and, and as part of that, um, there is this, this kind of uh, Lenten quality to the, to the end of the book, where if Palm Sunday and, and Ash Wednesday here, this is in New Orleans. And then finally Easter, this is Crystal. So I have this little video, very brief, don't worry. Um, I, I quickly put this together a while ago uh, as a way to, because people ask, how do you take pictures or what do you do? And, and the biggest part of my taking pictures is this talking people into taking their picture. So no, notice the hand gestures. Uh, this, one, uh, this one writer called me a used car salesman of an artist. So. It is a big part of it. <laughs> it's, so, it's so humiliating. So here we go. So I, and I use this big camera, which is awfully slow. And, it, and part, of it is, uh, part of it is this viewing experience where the image is upside down. And, uh, and it, it's actually a really beautiful thing. Another part of it is, notice the subject matter is just waiting and waiting and waiting. <laughs> and, and the end result of that, I found, is that the subject becomes less aware of themselves. Uh, they've been standing there for so long that they're, they're no longer posing, I feel like. So there's that. Uh, this is Herman's bed. This is in Louisiana. I love this, this, this idea that people are just doing these creative things for themselves. And in this case, I. I, dr I drove by this house, and it was in uh, Kenner, Louisiana, and it was kind of folk arty on the outside, and this, and this guy came out, and he said, oh, you gotta come inside, and, and it, this, this was it, this was his house, it was remarkable. Another bed, this is in Venice, Venice, Louisiana, south of New Orleans. So in the end, um, my big dream, you know, people ask me, well, what is your dream? And it, and it was to make a book of photographs. And I didn't, I didn't think I would actually publish a book of photographs, so I, I made this, this handmade book, made a bunch of copies of them, and, and one thing led to another. And the book actually got published, and, and all the dreams came true. And so the next thing, so I said, well, what should I do now? And, and I thought about playing around with being a working photographer, being out there in the world, taking pictures and, and so I've been doing this uh, sometimes it's really bad pictures uh, this is for fortune magazine nothing great about this but I get to go to China and and uh, <laughs> dress up in outfits and then uh, while I'm there I get to take my own pictures on the side and so I have this ongoing series of portraits which which were shown recently at the MIA uh, here I am this is in 
Tennessee on, on assignment for something. A lot of, I, I really love the equipment that I get to wear. The goggles made this picture on that assignment. And then finally this one, I, this, this was taken just this last weekend and I have to tell you this story because a week ago today, uh, really a, around this time, I got a call from the New York Times saying, we'd like you to go to New Mexico, Louisiana, and Florida to photograph chimpanzees and have it all done by Monday. <laughs> and and I, like an idiot, I said yes. And so it was eight flights. Um, what they told me late, after I'd committed to it, they told me about the, the feces throwing, which is <laughs> what, what this is for. And it, so, <laughs> so the... Uh, the romance of travel is a little bit worn off for me. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, you know, I get great experiences. I photographed Andy Goldsworthy, you know, someone who I was always interested in, made my own picture of him. Um, and, and I'll quickly show you this one. This was an assignment about a month, month and a half ago uh, of marine mothers from the New York Times. And the reason I, I wanted to show you this is if you look at the woman on the left, if you notice the car behind her, that's my van. So, I, so for all the young photographers out there, <laughs> you can drive around America too. Um, I'll just briefly show you the, the new personal project which I've been working on, which is in Niagara Falls. Quite different than the Mississippi work in that uh, where I think of, of the Mississippi project being about this, this kind of boyish wanderlust the Niagara work is about love and, uh, and, and life after the honeymoon in a lot of ways. So just kind of fly through some of these pictures, please. Hello. Oh. It's great old motel architecture. And as part of this, I'm collecting love letters, which are sort of like those uh, those written statements, I won't read much, just to the love of my life, I just wanted to tell you that you take my breath away. You're amazingly perfect. I believe that you were sent from the heavens above. And on and on. <laughs> sorry, that's kind of mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is at a pawn shop. There's this interesting kind of marriage between the, uh, there's, the uh, there's the Canadian side, in the, in, which is really thriving in, in a touristy sort of way, and the, and the American side, which is, which is really desperate, and, uh, and so many pawn shops over there. <laughs> this, is, this is volume two of Chantel's Kiss Diary, no joke. This I love. Dear Angela, when we first met, I'll never forget you walked up the road and talked to me. I didn't think you were cute, but now that I've had the chance to know you, I fell in love with you. <laughs> Phil's got to work on his, uh, his opener. These are ballroom dancers. <laughs> if there are any kids, it's time to leave right now. So. <laughs> And it, it was completely unintentional. I mean, when I, when I first started the project, it was all about love and it was gonna be a happy experience. And I told my wife that I'd dedicate the book to her and, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not sure she wants that anymore. It's, uh, it's, gotten really, it's gotten really dark for whatever reason. It is a pretty dark place. And the, I can't read this with my mother here. Uh, it's a, they, they ang they're angry letters, not just love letters, but, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Enough. <laughs> so. <laughs> Originally, I wanted every picture of the falls to have a rainbow in it, just to kind of counteract. I love this. Uh, if there was a nice apartment and I have a decent job and you felt happy and thought there could be a nice history together, would you come home? I, I love that. That's it. Thank you. So I, okay, so. that's fine. So is this on? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was wonderful. You know what uh, Oscar Wilde called uh, Niagara Falls, the second greatest disappointment in America. Yes, American exactly. <laughs> I know. And, and it, it was unintentional. I mean, I, I had read that quote and wanted to get away from that. Uh, because the falls itself really is dramatic. It's a beautiful thing. But boy, it, it's, a, it's a bleak place as you circle around it. This has been one thing that's really different working there is that is, is just the shape that I travel because Mississippi was this, was this southern trip but also a very squiggly trip because it doesn't go directly north to south, it's kind of doing this. And Niagara Falls I end up just being stationed there and I just circle round and round and so there's this kind of tedium to it that's, uh, that's maybe somehow become part of the the pictures as well. Well, that is your narrative because yeah. there's all those things, tell stories, the fragments of letters and the hot top motel room doors and all of that. And you're right, the Canadian side is different from the American side. And it's, a, it's another place for a dramatic American story because it had a lot to do with the great uh, struggles between uh, Edison and uh, uh, Westinghouse about uh, the mm. electricity generated mm. in Niagara Falls. You know, we would Nikolai Tesla was involved in. So there was this amazing history too. And I'm not sure when it became a honeymoon place. I think it was probably right then toward the end of the 19th century. That's well, this is why you, we have you here because uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not a writer and I'm not a historian. And I, uh, and I actually, I prefer not to do as much heavy research because I don't want to be over influenced by what I expect to find. I don't ways. like research either, but I would get there and I sort of you suddenly realize how much junk I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, right. Well, and 40 the, books. Well, I mean, all of these a, trips, too, you know, I mean, I sort of go, go these places, and then I think, well, this time I'm going to read the books before I get there, mm. which doesn't work. Then things I know get in the way, and then I think, well, no, I'm going to read the books after I go so I can have fresh experiences. The last... Uh, uh, Guy who did the Mississippi documentary that was terrific. I don't know if you uh, read this. Was uh, um, um, uh, uh, Rabin, uh, Jonathan yeah, yeah, Rabin. Uh, yeah. He went solo alone. Do you yeah. travel alone? I, yeah. I, when I uh, when I do the assignment work, I usually have an assistant. But it's really important with the personal work to not have an assistant. And it's also I found that it's really important to drive. That if I just fly somewhere, I don't. It's like I don't move into it in a way, that I need that alone time and that car time to, and listening to the radio is to just get away from everything. Um, so that, and it's really important to be alone because it's so much of this, of this circling around and, and it would be just incredibly boring for an outsider. And so I find your pictures very evocative and very filled with this kind of silence around them, the solitude around them, which is terrific because uh, most of the, the, the Rhodes Scholar, this film I made, and the, uh, you know, the sort of trips I've taken were, were produced in a way, and so the producers are always in the way. Sure. You never have enough time to, uh, to be alone with any of your subjects. So you're right, I mean, it's sort of what happens is a poem scribbled in a notebook or something mm. that's the side, side 
part of it, and it's it's always a smaller part of it. I mean, if you run, you know this because you go on assignment. Of course, you know Walker Evans worked for Fortune. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I told Andre before we came out here that I did this assignment recently for Life Magazine, and they, right before I was going to get on the plane, they asked me to make the pictures happy, <laughs> and <laughs> and it was really weird because I. I I can't make a happy picture. It's a bit of a problem, actually. It's like Romanians don't <laughs> smile. That's right. <laughs> right, right, right. They photographed sure. us earlier too, and it was, it was a sullen it's picture. Let me tell you. Made me laugh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Hope that never sees the light of day. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean these are you know these are producers' ideas. I mean I'm sure these uh, you know you do what you can. When I went to David Graham to Cuba. Uh, I was writing these very grim things about the people I met who were telling me this very tragic story, and David was just snapping away and making a very sexy and colorful looking mm. <laughs> Cuba, yeah. you know, which didn't have much to do with mine. But uh, the same thing happened with Walker Evans, actually. Yeah. And, uh, because he, he, he went to Cuba with a uh, left-wing uh, uh, journalist, I can't remember his name, the, uh, he wrote a book called The Crime of Cuba, and mm. uh, it originally was published in 31 photographs by Walker Evans, and Evans took the pictures, and they really have very little to do with this right. kind of dense, you know, group, angry prose this yeah. guy was writing at the time. <laughs> well, and I do have this real hunger for narrative, for, for real storytelling, and and I've liked that idea of working with a writer, but whenever it's happened with a magazine where the writer's been next to me, it's a disaster because you're both looking for such specific things and for your own things, and, uh, and the, the two just don't mesh. But well, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting thing. I mean, I got along with uh, David well, mm -hmm. but our cameraman our, uh, didn't get along with him at all. So we had a, the the moving picture and, and the still right. photographer. They just didn't even talk to each other. Right. Uh, they thought they were in each other's way all the time. I know, sort of like both of them. Then I tried to get away on my own because you need time to write in your notebook. And yeah. so it just, you know, it's, a, it's an odd thing to have creative people uh, able to collaborate. Mm. Um, <laughs> I mean, I love collaboration. I teach, you know, I mean, I try to always get my students to do things together, but, you know, how to, to think quickly and, you know, how much. Uh, time you need and how much you need, what kind of rapport you need to establish with people and, and trust and, you know, and those are all different, very different uh, than actually making the work together. We, we did something in, on New Orleans, you know, your picture with uh, Ash, uh, the, yeah. the woman is a yeah. wonderful, wonderful picture. But it, uh, this last uh, Mardi Gras, we were in a bar, we closed the bar because the police comes at midnight and just kind of washes everybody off the streets with the, with the uh, hoses, you know. <laughs> and uh, for the fire department, actually, just you know, right. clears everybody out. People just retire into the bars. And so there were a lot of good Catholics who saw the morning uh, come and they just uh, took the, made the ash ones, they crossed directly from the ashtray and went off. <laughs> Well, that, do you know my story on this? No, it's, I, I photographed her the, yeah, the next day after Mardi Gras, and, uh, and, and I asked her if I could take her picture, and she said, well, will you buy me a beer? And I said, well, I don't think that really, that really works with the whole Ash Wednesday thing. And, uh, and she said, all of these the cigarette ashes. So that's my, that's my story. It's a, yeah. it's a costume. It's a yeah, tradition. You right. ran into an old tradition. Right, right. And... And see, I love a little nugget like that, a little story, but I've, I've always I've struggled to figure out how to make it part of the work. In the, in the book, Sleeping by the Mississippi, at the very end, I have these little paragraphs that tell some of the stories behind the pictures. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, I would be embarrassed to put them near the pictures because I'm not a writer, and whether or not that's effective, I don't know. But. Well, you found, uh, you know, I mean, in, in the process of looking for what you're looking for, you found this other river, and it's one that hasn't been photographed. I mean, there, is, there are things about the river that have been done over and over, sure. and so those right. images are very familiar. I mean, a lot of familiar images of New Orleans and Mardi Gras and cemeteries right, and all right. that stuff, so it's, it's become, that's a very difficult thing to photograph because it's already there in some form or fashion, right. but it's almost like you hit new territory, it was new, a new place. Well, that's why I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't worry about, about owning the subject matter in a way. Like, you know, 
how, how can you do a Mississippi project when so and so has already done it? I mean, it's it's inevitably going to end up so different. I feel like you well, know. Mississippi's it has all its history yeah. aroused this kind of different different feelings in mm. in in all in not just in artists but in anybody who's written about it or dealt with it in any way whatsoever. The, uh, uh, my friend Doug Brinkley and uh, uh, Stephen Ambrose wrote a book together. They they uh, went on the Mississippi River from. Uh, um, Minnesota to New Orleans, or was it the other way? I can't remember now. But anyway, they did the river, and it's written in a very optimistic vein. Mm -hmm. You know, they're historians, and they right. see the river as this great uniter of a continent. You know, the river that made America, and uh, um, sort of Huck Finn's River too. One of you know social struggles. You know, as you right. go from the south to the north, and and, and so on. And and then there are books like. Uh, um, the one I, uh, I just mentioned, Old Glory by Jonathan mm -hmm. Raven, who went alone and he's an Englishman and he has this kind of distance that, you know, there's a tradition of English travelers sure. coming to America and they're sort of slightly snide, you know, they see things <laughs> and they just right. sneer at them, you know, they see, because it, um, one of them is a first visitor to Niagara Falls who, who sort of said so much uh, water over such a body of rock, <laughs> right. you know. Um, I said, yeah, okay. You know. They would have liked it to be a little more miniaturized, like an English garden, you know. It was a little too wild. Right. <laughs> um, but, so, you know, but Raben was very lonely through the whole trip. And, and you could, you know, in his book, I mean, he just traveled alone and he met all kinds of other loners. Mm. And so there is that river, you know, the kind of river of this kind of lost uh, souls. People who just didn't keep up with their times and right. you know whatever you know they went off progress went off right. somewhere else the railroad yeah so the you know it's a, it's a sort of a great uh, uh, lie detector or some kind of psychological reader you know of mm. the American psyche the, uh, the Mississippi River I mean so I mean but you own it in a way I mean now you photograph that you own that you know view of it um yeah but i don't i don't make any claims for any kind of documentary representation of the river i for example i didn't photograph the cities i didn't photograph really minneapolis or st louis or and and i was aware of that but i but i knew that i was fashioning just my own little mississippi well there is that i mean all the artists i know and i i have a lot of friends who are artists you know i, I myself never made any but they always look at the image they're happy to have writer friends because then they tell the stories of what they right. made you know and <laughs> right. they say well this is you know so it's a it's a mutual uh, of some mutual benefit uh, uh, of course the artists always end up getting rich you know and moving out of town and then the writers stay behind you know so <laughs> i know how that works you know so, um, it worked like that in new york for a while but uh, <laughs> so um, what do you think about this issue of of pictures and poems not being able to tell stories do you well you know i don't think i think that you know you 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 uh in it depends. Now, these are very large categories, you know, yeah. poems and pictures, but I, I think where uh, uh, what you're saying, in a way, I mean, is that you can, you can telegraph uh, a, a, a vision or an impression or a momentary uh, understanding of, of something, uh, and then you figure all the stories come with it. You don't need to tell them. In other yeah. words, you know, if you write, it's like writing a novel or an essay, you have to do an awful lot of explanation. Right. You have for your reader, you know, I mean, for right. your sort of middle brow or uh, reader, you know, you, you, but I don't think that's quite necessary. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I've done it because I need to earn a living, you know, so I've watered down certain huh. insights, you know. Uh, but you don't find, you don't, as a reader, you don't find it satisfying to have that feeling of, of, Going with the flow of the as a reader, out. yes, yeah. but as a writer, no. Right, right. They're two different things, you know. And I mean, actually, my favorite, the books that are most useful to me, the the, the books that are most useful are books I can never finish, because mm. I get very excited about the prose, about the art of of the sentence and mm -hmm. the way they 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 are made that I want to do my own. Mm. But then there are the stories, you know, that I like to read like everybody else because I want to know what happens and mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, go through them. But I would rather not produce those, you know, if I had my, my choice. I would just write, you know, a few poems mm. and hang out. But I don't... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, there has to be a lot of work. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Um, but you know, poems. I mean, you know, there are. This, this is a. You know, the the Europeans of poets of the 19th century figured out that all the stories were told. So Baudelaire could write a, a poem in Paris, and you knew it was suffused by Paris and everything that ever happened there. Right. So he didn't really have to say, I am in Paris now looking right. at a dead dog writing right. a poem for my <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> um, right. But no, I don't know why I think the sort of uh, l level of assuming that uh, people don't know what they know is, is sort of lowered, you know, I think, since those days. I mean, we don't seem to, to know as much as, you know, Parisians, Parisian readers of Baudelaire's Day knew, you know. I mean, mm. we seem, or publishers assume that we know less, you know. That's why they demand sort of happy faces and explanations, mm. you know. I mean, it's, you know, because it's, it's sort of like this idea that there's always somebody dumber than the producer, you know, which is not true because producers are usually the dumbest people around. <laughs> Yeah, but I think there's something, uh, there's something... At least in my experience. I like accessibility, and I like the... I, I, I don't think it should have to be work in a way. And one of the things I dislike about the contemporary art world in some ways, and, and, and at times uh, contemporary poetry, is the inaccessibility. And it, All my poetry is um, uh, wheelchair accessible. <laughs> 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 At least till you, <laughs> until you get in, then you can't get out. Right. That's <laughs> the entryways look great, you know. So that's not actually my favorite kind of art, you know. So California, you, know, you can Hotel California, you know, you can get in. Can oh, get right, out. right, right. It's a genre. <laughs> These are my Hotel California poems. See, my publisher is here, Alan Cumberland. He knows all about it. <laughs> So what's uh, so your Niagara project? Are you still going back to it? Yeah. So I made five trips, and I mean, I I see the end in some in some ways. Um, but and I'm and I'm, I'm actually going to make an effort to do something a little cheerier next time around. We'll see what happens. But uh, what can I say? Uh, I do I do think of it as a book once again. I mean, I have this this weird split, you know, because I use this big camera, which which enables me to make large prints that are very detailed and all of that. And I enjoy that experience, but there's something about compiling it in the book form, which for me is, is for photography, it's kind of the ultimate medium because you can, uh, and this, is, this relates to the solitary nature of making the pictures, I think, as a, an individual person can sit down with it and just go into it in a way, which I think is really satisfying. And it's something that, say, movies don't offer. Well, there's another story, though, in the fact, in how you produce these pictures because of the camera you use, and then you do mm. all that work of convincing people to... Right. So that's a story. I mean, that's a, yeah, that's yeah. Quite a story. Well, and the weird, I mean, the weird thing about that is that, uh, I mean, I was this, this very shy person, and, and it was completely against my nature to, to do that sort of photography, that approaching people. And, and somehow it's been like, therapy or something and I and this kind of thing I mean forget about it I mean uh, sort of your nightmare situation right here but uh, face, face your fears man <laughs> right they're Rights all are named Kodrasko yeah. right. well yeah I mean I'm, uh, should I get on the couch uh, no I uh, my, my parents are both photographers you know right. so I have a love-hate uh, relationship to the medium mm -hmm. my mother made me pose through my whole childhood you know and she she didn't like most of how I looked, and she would, she would say, take off that face, it looks like a butcher's face. <laughs> you know what she had against butchers particularly, since when there was never any meat around, we thought that it was great when there was some, but um, she posed, and then, you know, later on, I just, you know, I just uh, became always self-conscious about cameras and being around cameras, and so, uh, I'm incredibly, I'm very attracted to photography, to the medium. But there's something in the depths there that's, uh, yeah. Well, there is something ugly about it. And we just had our picture taken earlier, and it was, uh, I mean, I hate it. I, uh, uh, there's something false feeling about the experience. And I, and I know that I subject other people to that. But a lot of people don't mind, interestingly. And 
Do, do you think that uh, people are easier to convince now to, to, to have their picture taken than it was some years back? I have, no, I have no idea on that, but what I can tell you is that I had no problems along the Mississippi River for whatever reason. Uh, it was just sort of magic. Everyone said yes, except this one guy in Iowa. Uh, but otherwise, it was great. And the further south you go, the better it is. Mm -hmm. And Niagara Falls, I get rejected all the time, nonstop, and sometimes in an angry sort of way. Hmm. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's regional, I don't know if my approach has changed, I don't know what it is, but, although certainly there's something to, you know, southern climates, uh, you know, being warmer and, and, and friendlier to that sort of thing. It's interesting, I think people are more, uh, I mean, I've noticed this when I do interviews of any kind, is that people are more eager to, to talk and allow themselves to be photographed or filmed, it seems like they're already on film in their head. Mm. And when you ask them, they just step into the place and just continue right. something that they've started because our culture is so visual that people probably, you know, since they're children, they start sort of rehearsing mm. the picture. Um, Whereas I think some time ago, I remember it was a very difficult thing to get somebody to pose. Mm. I always said no automatically mm -hmm. if people wanted to take my picture. And now it just seems to be part of... Right. Well, that know, is something I've thought about is that if I ask people, I mean, if, if someone asked me what I asked of them, I would always say no. It, w one clue is this, this business about where I have people write down what their dream is. Because they're, I mean, often it's, it's the, I want to be a supermodel, I want to be a famous actor that kind of thing. So there is this real hunger to be acknowledged in some way. Uh, so, so, and that, that's television culture to a certain degree, I think. So. Well, in the streetcars in New Orleans, there is a sign, I mean, it's put there by the city that says, if you are photographed or um, on the streetcar, it's, uh, you, I mean, you can be photographed or filmed on the streetcar. Which mm. seems an odd kind of invasion of privacy you know, in that particular space, you know, because mm. nobody, they can do it without asking you. Right. And uh, because the city itself is becoming a big set for movies. Right. And so, the, you know, I mean, the state is giving ta tax breaks to filmmakers to come there, and the city already looks very photogenic, and so they, they love to <laughs> come there. So the whole city slowly, is, there's going to be nobody who won't be photographed. <laughs> right, you know, right, you know. right. Uh, except for the people you found are probably gone, man. It's, they exist only in your pictures. That picture of the bed with uh, that's, that's on the cover of the book is so filled with pathos, you know. I mean, just to see that person having mm. lived and tried and gone, you know. It's just a very, very melancholy, very sad picture. Mm. Yeah. Well, at, at what point do we open her do up we, for Do we questions? talk to the people in the dark? Or? Yeah. I can't see a thing, so. Uh, Questions in the dark. There's one over there. Um, you're an, an admittedly shy person. I was just wondering if you could tell us some stories about you getting to the position of taking those new portraits. There must be a story there. Right. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, well, I mean, this is the thing about photographing people is that it really, is this exciting experience. Uh, when, when it goes well, when you approach someone and, and you have this encounter, which is like this performance in a way, or this dance. And, and for me, it, it's, it, sometimes I feel like it's ruined landscape photography because it's so stimulating. And, and with the Niagara work, you know, it was, it was about love and intimacy and, and so the nudity became part of it, but it was also this, this like enhanced version of that, this even going further with, with the intimacy and the, and the... I mean, for me, a lot of photography is just, is just the ability to stand there and stare at a person, which is, is a, quite a luxury. And so to stare at them nude is even a, more of a luxury. And so that's partly what it's about. So it's... Uh, but it's not as... It's actually not as awkward as you might think. I mean, it's after a while, it's kind of like life drawing or something like that. Where these are people you just met on the street or in a bar. Or... Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> right, <laughs> that kind of thing. I mean, the negotiating is is you know goes on much longer. Uh, 
and, and this is something that's different about the Niagara work than Mississippi is that since I keep going back to the same place, I know certain people and they introduce me to other people and, and it goes on like that. So, uh, I mean, admittedly a big part of it is for me, as with all the photographs, is my own experience and my own hunger for this experience. But it's also seeing the, the intimacy between people and, and, and the way people pose together. I, I'm, I'm much better at photographing a single person because they're looking right at me and we're having this encounter. When you get two people in the picture, who do you look at? How is it working? And, and what I became interested in is, is sometimes maybe separating a couple a little bit and seeing how they might lean into each other or hold each other and, and sort of watching the relationship function in that way. So, More questions? Oh, bunch over here. Uh, only with yeah with the Niagara work I've done a, yeah, yeah I've done some of that and actually uh, I've I've purchased some of those letters <laughs> just uh, yeah. I just want to know uh, how did uh, how does Mr. Onion Vesta feel about the letters because I find it very like, it really does open makes a narrative out of it completes the picture or, or makes it combines them. I think they're wonderful. I mean, those are genuine. Question. Oh, uh, the question. I think it was uh, how. Uh, what about the narrative dimension that the letters add to the thing, to the pictures? Huh. I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, sure, they add quite a bit. They're very touching. They're real letters. They're pretty amazing. Um, um, I'm always fond of things I find, you know, I pick mm. up every letter or scrap of paper because there's always some kind of uh, poetry in it and just the fact of it being lost or blown around in the wind or somebody t uh, abandoning it or selling it, is there's mm. something very touching in that and uh, especially the mistakes, you know, the sort of, if they're written sincerely and not very well, they're even better. Yeah. Well, and, and for me, f getting those letters has felt exactly like getting a good picture in a way where it's all this, all this work, you know, asking people if I could look at their love letters and, and them not trusting me and this long back and forth. And then you get them, and when you get a good one, it's just so satisfying because the poetry is so beautiful. And, and that's what I think great photography often is, is it's, as, it's as simple as plucking out someone's letter. It's... Uh, it's just this fragment from the outside world. But, but I still say it's not narrative. I mean, it suggests a narrative, but it just doesn't do it all the way. Well, these are, I mean, you know, you don't really need to tell the story beyond that. I mean, that story's there already. If you have, you know, a letter like that, it's almost, it's a universal story. Right. Um, so what you choose to find in it is that moment of intensity. It's, it doesn't need all that scaffolding. Mm. I have a question for both of you, and that is how long uh, do you expect or hope and imagine your photographs or your poems will last? 1,400 years. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to him. I don't know about the yeah. medium. You Color know, photographs so. last about 80 years. So. You know what I mean. Though. Yeah. Somebody will find it, read a poem, or see a photograph. Well, I've been, for the past five years, I've been uh, forcing my students to memorize my works. <laughs> <laughs> it's their final exam, you know. So. It says over my <coughs> door of my office, uh, reproduction is forbidden, but authorization is, re uh, memorization is authorized. <laughs> um, well, I don't know, you know, I mean, as long people don't really, uh, people remember certain things that they don't, I mean, how long do these things last? I have no idea because if you look at uh, an anthology of great poems from the 1940s, you know, you won't recognize any of the right. names in there. You say, who are these people? <clears throat> um, no, I expect mine to last 1,400 years, like I told you. <laughs> because um, um, 
I've, I've, I'm, I've totally, totally stripped my poetry bare of things like metaphors and uh, pretty things, and now they are sort of severely Chinese in a certain way. <laughs> so they will last as long as the Chinese poems have from the fifth century of the day. <laughs> Ah, uh, uh, of mine? Yeah. I don't, I haven't, let's see. Uh, here's an epitaph I wrote uh, under a, uh, I made up a person named Julio Hernandez, and here is his epitaph. It says, Julio Hernandez does not lie here. He lies in your grave. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there is a great answer to that, and it's by Ted Bergen, a wonderful poet, uh, uh, New York poet uh, called People of the Future. He said, people of the future, while you're reading these poems, remember, you didn't write them. I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you see um, the Mississippi and the Niagara projects maybe expanding into explorations in other locales in the U.S. landscape, or maybe even taking it abroad to explore internationally? No, no, I think I'm, I'm done for a little while with the, the working on that model of a, of a specific place and circling around it and a waterway and all of that. Um, next thing will be different. But, and for what it's worth, I didn't show, if you go to my website, www.alexoth.com, uh, you'll, see, <laughs> you'll see there's a project following the Mississippi work uh, that was done while adopting my daughter in, in Columbia. And, and that's its own little, that has its own little life. It just doesn't quite fit into the, the flow of this talk tonight. But uh, no, all sorts of things. One of the reasons I do editorial work is, is hoping that one of these things is going to, you know, could spark the next thing as well. The, the chimps did not do it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the government is taking pictures of us wherever we go. Uh, would you comment on, on the fact that uh, the government now t feels free to take pictures of us as we cross the street, as we go to shopping centers? And Andre, of course, you grew up in such a, a society. Yeah, but the documentation is very poor. <laughs> <laughs> it was both the commies and the FBI took very bad pictures for them. <laughs> For a long time. They won't um, last 1,400 years. No. They won't last. And you know, actually, I was sort of disappointed in what Ed Sanders called the Boswells of the bureaucracy for how poor their narrative sense and their record keeping is, and how they try and make a life fit into a bureaucratic language. It's a great disappointment. Um, I think there should be more writers in charge of watching us. <laughs> Or photographers. So. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how to answer that other than I, I know that I don't like taking people's picture without their permission. I'm, I, I've done it and I do it for certain things, but I'm uncomfortable with it. Uh, just as, you know, I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want someone, be it the FBI or whomever, photographing me. So, uh, but it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. And of the crimes out there, photographing someone without their permission is pretty low on the totem pole. I do, yeah. And I, it's, it's such a slow process that it, it's basically where I get their address and I send them a copy and, and all of that. Well, Walker Evans did that wonderful series in the subway during yeah. the war, taking right. people's uh, <laughs> photograph with a hidden camera and their right. extraordinary pictures. Because well, and they recently banned Photography in the New York subways, they and, then, and then, but they, they yeah, and then they, yeah, and then they rescinded it. Um, but what about the guy from Iowa who wouldn't let you huh. take a picture? What was he like? Can you describe him? Uh, what was the, the guy from Iowa who said no? I mean, I, I cannot resist a guy with a metal detector. It's like <laughs> <laughs> I can't. So, and you know. Sometimes it's a paranoid group of people, so <laughs> that's, that's the story. Do you ever feel like always asking permission of your subjects compromises some of the spontaneity of your work? 
Oh, absolutely. I miss millions of pictures because of the way I work. But it's just... Well, don't you have to lie to them? I mean, in a way, because you you self-implicitly make them feel like it will be a great, happy picture, and they will look terrific, and then you do what you do. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving. <Okay. laughs> wow, that was, a, that was a tough one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm really, yeah. And, and there's this thing, because I send people a copy of the picture, and, you know, I do not get a lot of feedback. <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, most people don't look like they do anyway. I mean, well, that, and that's the thing is, you know, I don't, I don't like photographing people I know, and because they never look, they don't look like that. Uh, so I know that I'm creating this kind of fictional world using, I'm using people. It's ugly. Well, you know, but uh, I mean, as you know, was it um, Gertrude Stein said to Picasso, I don't look like that, and Picasso said, you will. There's <laughs> 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 a question. Actually, this is one comment I wanted to make uh, about Alex's photographs, is I think they're very serious. I don't think he laughs at anybody. I didn't think he... I think there's a great deal of gravitas to his right. images. But some people do, and I think you just kind of naturally, if you're in a certain position, and then you wonder, why am I laughing at that? I mean, do they know that we're laughing at them? But not maybe laughing right. at them in a mean way, but... Well, there's something about pity, in a way, that's... that. A vote. I mean, pity in some ways is so close to empathy because we're feeling ourselves, and and that feeling yourself is an uncomfortable thing. Just as when you see someone trip and fall, it can, it's hysterical in part because you know about yourself losing control, and so, so it has to do something with something like that. When you, that's the thing about the quiet experience of the book that's different. I mean, here a big group of people, it, it laughter might. Be evoked, but in a, you're not looking at the book and <laughs> you know it's it's very it is more serious. So. Yeah. Commentary is actually adding to that as well. I think. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. You work, uh, you know, your work is serious, and you work through empathy. I do too. When I when I interview people, I, I work to a great deal of empathy, even people that I can't, you know, structurally, you know, my all my ideas are opposed to everything they stand for. I interviewed this uh, fascist in Romania. And, uh, you know, there was a point I had to find to really have a conversation with him where I had to sort of go beyond the, our, you know, ideologies, you know, mm -hmm. and I actually sort of, you know, it's like interview a reptile. <laughs> and, and uh, but, you know, there was, you know, the empathy was there, there was respect, so I didn't, you know, so I got a very good interview, so whatever he did to, to was he condemned himself in a sense through, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, you know, in his own words, but, um, um, I didn't at the time I was doing the interview. I wasn't really trying to catch him. You know, this is not the sort of like a sixty minutes. You know, uh, right, right? You know, the you know, get to the story. You know, uh, Wallace. Uh, you know, in the interview. So something else. So you know, you kind of merge it your mm. subject. I really don't like photographing people that I dislike. It's sometimes it's happened, but um, I, I rarely. I think make good pictures out of that situation, so. Way up there. Uh, go back to your idea of whether photographs tell a story or create a narrative. When you take your trip down Mississippi or when you go out to Niagara Falls and you choose a picture of someone to photograph, do you see how it fits into your whole uh, project or do you just choose something you like and then later put it all together? Yeah, I'm working on the, I'm working on the whole thing. I mean, I'm, it's, it's different with each project. With Niagara Falls, I have these taped lists of things that I'm looking for in the steering wheel. So I can just look down and, you know. <laughs> and Because I'm trying to piece this thing together, but at the same time, uh, well, it's, it's, I, I always say it's like those driving games where you're looking for a letter on a sign or something. It focuses your attention, but 
while you're focused, you might see something else. So I just need something to focus on. So I'm looking for, you know, guys with metal detectors or whatever it is. And, and that's how I find things. But yeah, I'm trying to shape this big thing. But you don't need yeah. to. I mean, a river is intrinsically narrative, and so yeah. is a road. I mean, right. it's just one thing follows another. You right. know, it's a picturesque kind of story, yeah. but it's a story. And I did much less of it. I didn't know what I was. I, I knew much less when I was doing the Mississippi work. I, just, I mean, I wasn't thinking because there are a lot of prisons. There's prostitution. I wasn't thinking this exists historically along the river, so I'm going to document it. It just it was there. It was, and I was curious. So, sure. It's a little of both. I mean, you, it's, you know what I was saying about the couples and watching how they fall together? You, you, you know, you, sometimes you say, okay, don't sit there, uh, sit over there. But while they're moving, you see them do something. So you're just watching them. But it, I mean, it's a completely unnatural situation. So it's not, it's not like I'm catching this, this special moment. Um, so it's, it's semi-posed. I mean, it's mostly posed. Ah, oh, she's lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, she suffered. Well, the, the, she actually smiles quite well. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> she has a good smile. Um, the Mississippi River means so much to people, so many people at so many different levels. Do you think all rivers are like that? Or in your European experience, are there other rivers that resonate with people as much as the Mississippi? No, the Mississippi is it. We loved it. When I was a child, we read uh, Huckleberry Finn and hmm. uh, the Twain stories of the Mississippi. All of it was translated into Romanian. For some reason, the, two, the three American writers that were allowed by the, our censors, you know, Mark Twain was one of them. The other was Jack London and uh, John Steinbeck. Uh, but um, um, all of Twain was translated, and I mean, it was just it made the most incredible reading. And all the, and it was the same all over Eastern Europe and Russia. And we were all dreaming about the Mississippi. That was the big fantasy river. That's that's a question I have for you. Is, is do you think there's something American about this kind of road movie or road novel? You know, oh, definitely. Just in the same way that there's something British about that kind of travel writing. Oh yeah, yeah. oh definitely. You know, I I think you know, I mean. Um, the, it's the idea of, of leaving, I mean, the, 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 first there was the, the westward expansion and the big migration mm -hmm. west, and so that is a fairly recent story. I mean, it's not that long, so the, the narratives of the great track west and the stories of the Lewis and Clark expedition and mm -hmm. what followed are really pretty much part of recent history. Then when the autom automobile came, uh, what used to be the Sunday drive kind of expanded and got mm. longer and longer. And so the, the road story really sort of dates to the mid-50s, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then uh, the river story is somewhat older than that, and it's really with Huck Finn and, uh, and all, of the, uh, all of that. So yeah, there's something very American because there wasn't so much mobility in Europe mm. because you, you're stuck to your place wherever you mm. were. I mean, you're socially stuck in your social class. You're stuck because... You know, where, where would you go? You know, and immediately outside your border, there started another kind of people who didn't particularly like you. <laughs> uh, so the idea of, um, I mean, there was the idea of travel, of wandering the woods. So you had the sort of like English poets in the mm. lake country, right. you know, wandering the woods and being inspired by nature. But the, and, and a few adventurers, you know, like uh, Giacomo Casanova in the 18th century, who mm. traveled by carriage very far from his native Venice all the way to Moscow, you know, which God only knows what that would have been like in a mm. horse-drawn carriage, you know, so absolutely <laughs> bone-breaking. But so, yeah, I mean, the idea of... Um, of this kind of joyful journey, you know, that's a long distance is, is very American. It has to do with the dimensions of this continent, the fact that it's a very big place. Mm -hmm. could, could you all speak to the scale, uh, maybe the intellectual scale of book? You, you sort of spoke about the intimacy that books allow for this one-on-one -on -one experience. Do books allow an artist or a poet room for other things? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, <laughs> point me in a direction. Uh, uh, I'm familiar a little bit with uh, Mr. Romescu's book art 
projects with mm. other artists, with printmakers, and these poets get work that's sort of expanded into this other visual realm in book arts. And when photographers make books, it's a very different experience than gallery, seeing your work at the mm -hmm. big fancy exhibition. Does the book allow you for something else intellectually room to expand into a smaller space but compact more in? Maybe it's a goofy question. No. I mean, no, it's a no. It's a very good question. Yeah. I think the book just makes it a story, even if it wasn't, because the pages are numbered and they go. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you turn them. That's you know one way of doing it. I mean, I don't always do that. I mean, I open photography books wherever. You yeah. Know, but I do that to any kind of book. Actually. Well, there's something just kind of unsatisfying about the individual image too. I I once worked at. Uh, suburban newspaper chain. I think there's someone here from, from Lily Suburban Newspapers, if you all know that. Uh, but, and, and we would, every year, we would submit pictures for this annual contest, and, and there was this old sports guy, and one year, you know, he was driving by, and he snapped this picture of a car and a tree or something like that, and he won the big award. And it's always been a lesson that, you know, taking a, a great individual picture is, you know, is so easy or so, it's just all about luck. But assembling those pictures together is, is a really difficult thing. And it's the, for me, it's the most satisfying thing is, is controlling that. The problem with uh, you know, museum and gallery exhibitions sometimes is just space limitations or what have you. So the, controlling that order and that sequence, because it is, it is like you know, lines of poetry putting it together. Uh, I mean, even you know, for like a talk this evening, you know, I'm cutting down the number of images, so how do I get the right mix to get the right flow going? And, and so much of the art is, is that for me. Hmm. Well, you can just internalize PowerPoints and whenever you come yeah. to... <laughs> yeah. Third eye PowerPoint. <laughs> Mm. Um, and I say almost the best sense of that word because it's like they fit in that background, but because you have them so centered, they displace themselves from that background. And it gets to be this curious dialogue between the two. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely do that over and over again, and, and sometimes I'm frustrated about it, but. Part of it's it's so satisfying for me to to take a person and just kind of carve them out of space and isolate them, and uh, and that's that whole business of just being able to stare at a person, and that's and that's the great thing about making prints for an exhibition or whatever. So you have this big print, and people can just you know stare. What if I could just spend ten minutes here staring? <laughs> it it would be a really satisfying and creepy sort of thing to do. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I start charging after two minutes. But, <laughs> but if, I did, if I did crazy compositions and all that, it would become about the composition, where it's, it really is about carving them out of space. But it also seems like another eye is staring at that environment mm. that is somehow part of them or is somehow related to them. And it's almost the way the two things start again. Mm. Well, the question of distance is interesting. I mean, how to distance from your character is, and what is the distance? I mean, I mean, you know, some people get very uncomfortably close. Some photographers, mm. you know, just a, there's a style of photography in the New York Times magazine for a while of getting people extremely close. Right, exactly. You know, yeah. it, was, it made me very uneasy when looking at those mm. people. I don't know if they still do that all the time, but. Um, I mean, how do you, did you come to that gradually to establish what your distance is? Yeah, I is? like, well, some of it's, it's technical, it's based on the camera, but I, I like this kind of middle distance, this sort of natural space. I mean, that, there is this, you know, we all have our personal space or whatever, but I like this mm -hmm. natural space. I thought about it a lot uh, as I was kind of analyzing this chimpanzee shoot and what went awry, <laughs> is that I was really, I was so incredibly far away for a lot of the pictures, and I hate that. I mean, it, for me, it takes away the whole 
experience of photography when you have this huge telephoto and something's on, you know, on the other end of a pasture. Um, part of the reason I keep bringing this up is it's going to come out, and I, I just want to apologize to everyone <laughs> right now. I've got a lot of anxiety about this. So. But distance is essential. I mean, there's, there are very few factors when you make a picture. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's where you stand. It's how far away the subject matter is. It's how you, what you crop out, and that's, that's it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you are creating a fiction, too, all the time, because you're showing this background and you're leaving out all this stuff that's going on on the sides. So it's... Where did you meet the guy with the airplane? Uh, that, that was in, in Minnesota. It's in Vesa, Minnesota. And I was, I was driving along, and he's got this, this house that's built up really high in the sky. And, and it was intriguing, and it, I, you know, I, you sort of sense when a sort of dreamer type lives somewhere. And I met him, and, and he, had, he had he called this room on, on the top of his house uh, his cockpit, which was great. And so I actually photographed him, not in there, but on, on the roof outside. And so, uh, and it's a lot of that. It's, it's, it's just be, seeing something, being curious, and, and, and stopping. Yeah. One more, question. One more question time. I yeah. just had wanted to comment. I think that the simplicity makes it so powerful. It, as they were talking about uh, how it looks so centered, and I think the reason it looks so centered is because the subject is so powerful because it's such a simple. It, it, it's such a simple. Well, it's just like the it's just like the love letters. It's just like the thing itself is interesting. The person themselves is interesting and you don't need to do a sort of fancy composition to, to of course sim it. simple is also a magazine though just like life <laughs> yeah simple that's right <laughs> well, sim simplicity is good the difference between simple and simplicity is like between globalization and globalité <laughs> On that note. <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, thanks.